Today's hearing comes at a crucial moment in this committee's investigation into the Biden administration's catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. For months after President Biden announced the withdrawal, his senior military advisors and his own intelligence community repeatedly issued dire warnings about the damage this would create. At the same time, I, along with other Republican and Democrat members of Congress, urged President Biden to uphold the conditions of the Doha Agreement. And most importantly, we urged him to prepare for the eventual fallout of our withdrawal. He ignored us and all, including his own State Department personnel, who issued a dissent cable in July, warning of the dire situation on the ground. Instead, as the Taliban takeover became imminent, the White House and State Department leadership stuck their heads in the sand. It was so bad, the State Department waited until the day after the Taliban captured Kabul to actually request an emergency evacuation, also known as a NEO. As a result of the Biden administration's failure to plan, the U.S. military was forced to conduct this emergency evacuation surrounded by tens of thousands of Taliban terrorists. Put simply, President Biden and Secretary Blinken put thousands of American lives at risk through their incompetence and willful blindness. And then the worst possible outcome, a terrorist attack at Abbey Gate on August the 26th, 2021, that killed 13 U.S. service members, wounded 45 more, and killed more than 170 Afghan civilians. It was the deadliest day for the United States in Afghanistan in over a decade. And today, we have some of the family members of the service members killed at Abbey Gate in the audience. They're here because they want accountability for their children's deaths. I'm gonna get them answers, the answers they deserve. I anticipate my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will attempt to spin this disaster as all being President Trump's fault. They will claim the Doha agreement forced President Biden to withdraw and that he had no choice, uh, but this is false. To that end, I want to remind everyone of two critical facts. First, the Doha agreement was conditions-based, conditions our witnesses here today negotiated. And as he can tell you, those conditions were not being met by the Taliban, and they are still not being met today. The Taliban is allowing terrorists like Al-Qaeda to flourish in Afghanistan. And the truth is that President Biden wanted to withdraw from the Doha agreement. And if he wanted to, he could have. He did just that with many of President Trump's other agreements, like Remain in Mexico. Second, President Biden himself said that even if the Doha agreement had never been signed, he would still have withdrawn all U.S. troops from Afghanistan exactly the way that he, he did. When asked by George Stephanopoulos, quote, he said, uh, would you have withdrawn troops like this even if President Trump had not made that deal with the Taliban? President Biden replied, quote, I would have tried to figure out how to withdraw those troops, yes. Our witness today, Ambassador Khalizad, someone I've known for quite many years, served as a U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation under President Trump, where he negotiated the Doha Agreement and was asked to remain on by President Biden. In November 2023, Ambassador Kalzog appeared before the committee for a nearly 12-hour closed-door transcribed interview. And voluntarily, I might add, and we thank you for that. And in that interview, one thing was made clear. The core problem was not the Doha Agreement. It was a president who refused to enforce it. I want to thank our witnesses, our witness for being here today. Ambassador Khalizad, I believe you have valuable information to share with this committee. And um, I know you've chosen to do so voluntarily, and I hope you do so with the same candor you showed in November. Um, and I really admire you, sir. You're not forced to appear here. We could have done that. Uh, you're doing this as a patriot and an American, um, and someone who is in the middle of all this from the very beginning with uh, so many facts to share with this committee. We thank you, sir, uh, for being here today. With that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me begin by also thanking you for hearing my call for transparency. 
at, at our November 23rd, November 2023 Afghanistan hearing. Yesterday, your staff sent us written notice of your personal commitment to publicly release all transcripts from interviews held during the, this Congress and in the committee's investigation into the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan after they are finalized on February 29th. This indeed is the right thing to do. The American people have funded our bipartisan oversight work and we owe them full transparency, not just misleading cherry-picked snippets. Such transparency is critical for any investigation. So I strongly hope that your commitment to make transcripts public will extend to the other oversight investigations you've initiated in this Congress and which witnesses have been questioned behind closed doors. We must not let this committee's activities become another typical move in a partisan game. And with that, let me thank Ambassador Calazard for appearing before our committee. Ambassador, you served under three different presidents in a variety of capacities during America's 20 years of war uh, in effort in Afghanistan. And your insights on the August 2021 withdrawal and the many decision points that led to the events of August 2021 are important to this committee's understanding. A 20-year war deserves comprehensive and bipartisan oversight. But the title of this hearing, How the Biden Administration Failed to Enforce the Doha Agreement, is telling. It is not titled, The Biden Administration's Failed Doha Agreement with the Taliban. That is because it was not Joe Biden who crafted the February 2020 deal. It was, in fact, his Republican predecessor that made the agreement with the Taliban that committed the United States to withdraw all of our troops from, from Afghanistan. Nor is the hearing titled, how the Trump administration failed to press the Taliban to live up to its commitments in the Doha agreement, but withdrew troops anyway. That would require scrutiny of the Doha deal since its inception under the Trump administration. I must say this because for some of my Republican colleagues, the challenges of Afghanistan began the day of Joe Biden's inauguration. That is not to say that the Biden administration is beyond congressional review or that there is nothing to learn from those eight months. But that is an eight month snapshot out of 20 years. At best, this fixation is oversight malpractice. At worst, it is historical revisionism, politically motivated to place the withdrawal with President, which, which President Biden inherited solely at his feet. Let's be clear, both President Biden and President Trump sought to end our forever war in Afghanistan. And President Biden ultimately achieved that goal. Our presence in Afghanistan has changed, but our core interests have not. And the United States continues to pursue those interests as it has demonstrated with the killing of, Emir, of the Emir of Al-Qaeda and a key 9-11 mastermind, Aman Izawi, uh, in 2022 in Kabul. This is not about pointing blame. This is about grappling with reality, with the facts we like, as well as the ones we don't. And with the sacred constitutional responsibility, we have to oversee the State Department and the U.S. foreign policy. To that end, I want to acknowledge Ambassador Dan Smith's statement, which is submitted for today's record. Ambassador Smith served for almost four decades at the State Department and returned at Secretary Blinken's request to lead its after action review, an independent review of the department's actions over the course of January 2020 to August 2021 related to the United States withdrawal. The results of his review, drawn from more than 150 interviews, are not just invaluable, but actionable and provide a roadmap we all should consult regularly to support the department's crisis management capacity and its single greatest assets, its people. Now, Ambassador Calazar, I know you have previously sat for a transcript interview on today's subject that lasted over 10 hours, and we thank you for that. That's a testimony to both your vast knowledge to share and your deep commitment to America and to our national security. So I look forward to your testimony 
And I hope that the American people can hear today what we have already heard behind closed doors. And with that, I yield. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be uh, submitted for the record. We're pleased to have uh, here today the Honorable Zalme Khalizad before us today. He served as a special representative for Afghanistan reconciliation at the State Department from September 18 to October 2021. Your full statement will be made part of the record. I now recognize Ambassador Khalizad for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member, and distinguished members of the committee. I welcome the opportunity to talk with you today about America's strategy in Afghanistan during my service as the special. on U.S. counterterrorism concerns and set the stage for Afghans to start negotiating an end to the war in their country. By the end of 2018, the President's decision was to bring the American forces home. Several factors that contributed to this decision. The conclusion that this war had gone on for too long with no end in sight. The opportunity cost was too high. The United States needed to focus on great power competition, that is China, Russia, and the threat from Iran. Afghanistan no longer was central to the war on terror. The goal of transforming Afghanistan into a modern and democratic state had been unrealistic. Despite best efforts, the country had huge governance problems and rampant levels of corruption. The administration recognized the potential risks involved in this policy. The greatest risk was the potential threat to US forces during withdrawal. The British withdrawal in 1842 and the Soviet withdrawal in 1988 and 1989 had been very bloody. A second risk was Afghanistan once again becoming the big platform for a terrorist threat against the United States homeland, US interests, and our allies. A third risk was the loss of gains policy, government and outside, but the president determined that the withdrawal was in the U.S. national interest. After more than a year of negotiations, on February 29, 2020, we reached two agreements, one with the Taliban and the other with the Afghan government. These provided a framework for U.S. withdrawal, dealing with terrorism, intra-Afghan negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan Republic, a permanent ceasefire, and future relations between the United States and Afghanistan. Key features of the agreement were phased withdrawal of U.S. forces over a 14-month period. Afghanistan was not to be used by any group or individual to threaten the security of the United States and its allies, intra-Afghan negotiations. Importantly, the Taliban committed not to attack U.S. forces once the agreement was signed. This was critical, and the Taliban adhered to it, killing no coalition fighter or U.S. soldier during the entire withdrawal period. The first phase of withdrawal lasted 135 days, in which the U.S. forces were reduced to 8,600. By the time President Trump left office, 
U.S. forces in Afghanistan had been reduced to, 20, uh, to 2,500. The U.S. retained the right to come to the defense of the Afghan forces if the Taliban attacked them, we exercised this right as needed. During the negotiations between the Afghan Republic and the Taliban, which started on September 12, 2020, they did not make any significant progress. After the November 2020 elections, President-elect Biden's team asked me to stay on. The administration had three options. One, withdraw from the Doha Agreement. Two, implement the agreement, but with changes, such as the extension of the agreed timeline, linking the withdrawal of remaining forces to the conclusion of a political agreement between the Taliban and the Afghan government, or insisting on leaving behind in Afghanistan a counter-terror force or withdraw the remaining forces without such linkages. The president announced in April of 2021 that we would add four months to the timetable for withdrawal for a total of 18 months. The withdrawal was not conditioned on a political agreement between the two Afghan sides because it was believed that such conditionality would risk a return to war without end and entrap the United States into reversing course and sending more forces again. It was also decided that our, that our over the horizon capabilities would allow us to monitor and respond to terror threats to the US from Afghan territory. On protecting social and political gains the approach was to advocate for key values in the course of intra-Afghan negotiations by pressing the Taliban on responding, uh, on respecting women's rights and human rights. The, the withdrawal proceeded based on uh, the new extended timeline. The assessment was that the Afghan government would remain in power and its forces would defend it and fight the Taliban during the withdrawal for some time afterwards. This assumption informed our plans. Although reasonable, the assumption turned out to be wrong. The situation on the ground began to shift significantly and rapidly in favor of the Taliban. They took over one province after another and by mid-August of 2021 were at the gates of Kabul. We had a last minute success in persuading the Taliban to return, to refrain from entering Kabul and instead to hold talks with government to reach a political deal for a shared government, a step to which both sides agreed. But this fell apart when President Ghani surprisingly fled the country, which caused the now leaderless Afghan military and police to instantly disintegrate. These developments led to the Taliban entry into Kabul, and this abrupt series of events obliged the U.S. to react, adapt, and improvise, as none of this had been foreseen in our plans to withdraw by the end of August. As we all remember, the final two weeks of chaos at the airport and the tragic loss of 13 brave Americans in an ISIS-K terrorist attack were difficult and what-ifs remain hotly debated. The, ev the events of those final days should not diminish the achievements made. We must all remember that after 9-11, we sent our forces to Afghanistan to decimate Al-Qaeda there. This was accomplished and represents a major win for the security of the United States. We, are, we all are grateful to those whose sacrifice made this possible and to their families. The struggle for Afghanistan is not over 
and Afghanistan's final chapter is certainly not written. The seeds of the values we planted may well bear fruit over time. It would be a mistake to turn our back on the country. The American approach going forward must take current realities in Afghanistan, the region, and the world into account while, remain, while remaining guided as elsewhere by our interests and enduring values. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you, Ambassador. I, I want to echo your uh, comments on uh, to our veterans that um, their service was not in vain. Uh, they protected this nation for 20 years uh, from a major terrorist attack like 9-11, and we thank them for that. We also want to thank the parents of Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez and Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole G., uh, who are here today, and to the Lopez family, Ms. Shamlin, and the rest of the Gold Star families, we honor uh, your sacrifice and your children. Um, in um, November, you testified before this committee in a transcribed interview, and you just restated that you presented to uh, the Biden administration and to the president uh, basically three options uh, on the Doha Agreement. One, uh, to basically ignore it and unconditionally withdraw, two, to uh, tear it up, and three, to enforce it, its conditions against the Taliban. Uh, you also uh, testified that you and Secretary Blinken both recommended to President Biden that he enforce uh, Doha's condition. But instead, the president ignored your advice or disagreed and chose to ignore the Doha conditions and unconditionally withdraw. Is that correct? I think there was uh, uh, the opportunity for me to brief the president, as you said, correct, and the options that he had. And it was clear that it would be desirable uh, that uh, the w final withdrawal happens after there is an agreement uh, between the government and the Taliban. And that was broadly supported, the, that idea. But uh, upon discussion and deliberation and consultations with allies and others, and the allies too favored uh, uh, withdrawal after there was an agreement between the government and the Taliban. But, uh, there was a judgment that the, if we did that, since that was not part of the Doha agreement, and that it could uh, result in a protracted delay in the withdrawal of forces as we couldn't be certain when and if the Afghans would reach an agreement. And if there was a risk of going back to war and perhaps sending more troops, the decision was not to pursue that and there was broad support for that decision. But your uh, recommendation to the president was to enforce Doha's conditions, correct? Uh, that, 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 that was part of the agreement, yes. And I, we restated that, that this was a condition-based uh, agreement. It was a package deal. Uh, there, there were linkages. What we did depended on the Taliban delivering on their commitments. Right, and, and the president uh, disagreed with you and chose not to enforce the conditions. Well, the, I, I described the discussion that occurred and the judgment that was made. And the conditions were not enforced, and as a result, the Taliban's in control of Af Afghanistan today, correct? Well, I would say um, uh, it's clear that the Taliban are in control, but uh, I would uh, put the responsibility for uh, what happened uh, largely uh, um, on the shoulders uh, of the Afghan government leadership uh, for not uh, uh, standing for uh, their government, for their system, and for the values that they said uh, they yeah, believed and I, in. And I agree. I think uh, President uh, Ghani's actions were uh, cowardice, and fleeing his country is a coward. Uh, not a good example. Uh, let me turn to the um, meeting you had in Doha between yourself, General McKenzie, 
and the Taliban leader, Mullah uh, Baradar, you said that the Taliban offered to give the United States control of Kabul for the purposes of evacuation, but that offer uh, was turned down. Uh, when asked by my committee uh, at your interview whether the Taliban viewed that as a, quote, green light to take over Kabul, you said, quote, I think that's clear. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, I agree that uh, uh, we had made an agreement uh, for the Taliban not to enter Kabul and uh, for a delegation to come from Kabul President Ghani had agreed to it as well to negotiate a power sharing government to take over uh, uh, on September 1 in a meeting uh, of 200 Afghan notables uh, present. Right. But, but McKinsey says that's not my mission because his orders are not to secure Kabul yes, in, for indeed. evacuation. His in, orders are to evacuate indeed, indeed. by July 4th. And, and he didn't have the troops right. allocated for that. Now, he right. could have raised that to the president. Uh, was was this meeting, to your knowledge, ever uh, reported well, to well, the White House? It was reported clearly to the entire government, uh, but it was reported uh, after General McKenzie said on the spot there that that wasn't, as you said, Chairman, his mission uh, to secure Kabul. And uh, the, the initial goal was for Taliban not to be in Kabul. In fact, that presented them with a map uh, of uh, uh, some 20 to 25 miles away from the center within that area that there should be no Talib uh, present. But the, the, uh, the departure of President Ghani and increased widespread concern uh, by Afghans in Kabul about law and order with the disintegration of the security forces, the options were either uh, that as uh, the Talibs offered that we take responsibility and General McKenzie, as you said correctly, Chairman, I was present in the meeting and that that was not part of his mission. And then the, uh, the discussion shifted to uh, where the Talibs could go for Because his investigation. understanding, McKenzie's understanding, that the President wouldn't authorize more troops to uh, take over Kabul for purposes of the evacuation. Well, uh, I can't comment on that because I no. wasn't present in any discussion if he may have had now, if, if that had president. happened, imagine wouldn't that have been a little different, right? We, we take over Kabul for purposes of the evacuation. The Taliban agrees to stay out in this 20-mile radius, uh, and they don't take over Hkaya. They're not part of this uh, chaos at the very end. And the suicide bomber coming from this uh, uh, prison out of Bagram, uh, for, you know, we, it, I'm not asking you to speculate, but it's very foreseeable that may never have happened. And yet... And this report does go to the White House, and yet nothing is done to change the course of events, correct? Well, uh, you, you, uh, your account is correct, uh, but we don't know what else could have happened uh, if uh, that decision was made. So that we, will, we, we we're entering speculation now. No, I guess the bottom fact. line is you, you really can't trust the Taliban. And I see my time has expired, and I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Meeks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'm not going to speculate because I don't think we should be speculating or just giving our own opinions uh, or paraphrasing of what you are saying. I want to take it for what you're saying and not going to guess on what my thoughts are because we want to do an investigation to determine what we should learn from it. All right. Let me join the chairman, though, in first saying to our Gold Star family, how much we appreciate you and the heroes that lost their lives. And I know that there's nothing that we can do to bring them back, but they are indeed heroes for our country. And I thank you for your sacrifices. And I'll tell you that no matter whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, I truly believe that we will always hold them dear and acknowledge the heroes that they are. Thank you for being here. Ambassador, you've worked tirelessly over the years to negotiate and implement the Doha deal, as did many others in our government. And I have some questions I want to ask based upon your experience. They're mostly yes or no, so we don't have to get into speculation and, and things of that nature. Now, Secretary Pompeo himself 
I think I have a picture here, uh, had gone to Doha to sign the agreement in a photo op with the Taliban leader, uh, Malou Babadir, after nearly two decades of being at war with them. And despite any criticisms of it, it is fair to say that concluding the Doha deal was a big deal. It was a significant event. Is that correct? Yes, uh, signing it was a significant event. And with the conclusion of the Doha deal, the Taliban then stopped attacking U.S. forces inside Afghanistan, fulfilling the top condition placed on it in the deal. Is that also correct? Correct. And the United States committed in the Doha deal to, quote, withdraw from Afghanistan <laughs> all military forces of the United States, its allies, and coalition partners, including all non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors, and supporting services personnel. Is that not correct? Correct. And arguably, that withdrawal was well underway in January of 2021, after President Trump, according to Ambassador Smith's statement for the record, quote, steadily withdrew U.S. forces, notwithstanding concerns about the Taliban's behavior. Is that correct? Correct. It, uh, we were down to 2,500, as right. I said. Yeah. And so in your expert opinion, what did you think the Taliban would have done if President Biden, just a few months before the original May deadline that his predecessor had set for a full withdrawal, would you, had just walked away entirely from the Doha Agreement, in your expert opinion? If we had walked away from the Doha Agreement, we would have been back, in my opinion, now I am offering an opinion. Yes, your expert opinion. Uh, we would, be, would have been back uh, in, uh, in fighting the Taliban. So we would have been back to where we were before the agreement. So Th That's my opinion. Right. So you spoke in your opening statement of the belief that imposing further conditions on the Taliban at that time, as you just stated, would risk a return to war. And you hold to that belief today. Is that correct? I do. And had President Biden sought to revise the deal to maintain a small number of troops in Afghanistan indefinitely, did the risk remain that the Taliban would resume attacks against them? Very likely. So I'm sure, Mr. Ambassador, you agree that the highest priority of the United States president should be to protect American lives, correct? Correct. Thank you. And even over other development or national security objectives, or even the welfare of our allies and partners? Of course, this gets into a complicated discussion. We do put lives at risk in defense of our interests and uh, our values, uh, as we did in Afghanistan for uh, uh, many years. Uh, so Let me ask my last question because I see yeah. I'm out of time. So, Mr. Ambassador, so in your own belief, do you believe that President Biden's completion of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021 was necessary to protect American lives? Certainly, American lives in Afghanistan, uh, uh, in terms of Amer American military forces, yes. I thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ambassador, thank you for your service. And uh, it's just so inspiring to be with you. So we're, we're grateful for what you've done for our country. Uh, and it, it's particularly uh, a time for us to appreciate the success of the American military for 20 years, right. uh, they stopped terrorist attacks in our country. And so as people look back, uh, 
we should appreciate the success of the American military. Very personal to me, my former National Guard unit, the 218th Mechanized Infantry of the South Carolina Army National Guard, led by General Bob Livingston, served for a year across Afghanistan, and they developed a great affection for their Afghan brothers. I was there four times uh, seeing firsthand uh, the success of what they were doing. And then I'm grateful to my uh, youngest son, First Lieutenant Hunter Wilson, was an engineer uh, serving with the Army Guard for a year in Afghanistan. So it's very personal to me uh, the absolute disgust I have uh, with uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, his shameful appeasement, surrender, and abandonment of the people of Afghanistan has led immediately to the death of 13 uh, young Americans who uh, at Kabul uh, Airport, even though the sniper had the uh, mass murdering individual uh, bomber in his sights, uh, which could have saved the 13 lives and could have saved, uh, indeed, hundreds of uh, poor Afghan citizens uh, who were murdered. Uh, but yet the Biden uh, rules of engagement uh, came into play and 13 young Americans died. Uh, with that, too, it's also given encouragement uh, to uh, what we're into now, which we did not choose, and that is a war, uh, dictators with rule of gun, invading democracies with rule of law. We saw that on February 24th, 2022, when war criminal Putin invaded Ukraine. We saw it October 7, when uh, Hamas, the puppets of Iran, invaded Israel. We see it today with the threats being made against the 24 million people of Taiwan by the Chinese Communist Party. All of this, to me, goes back to the shameless, shameful decision, uh, which I think is the most catastrophic in the history of the United States in terms of uh, national defense, security, uh, and foreign policy. Uh, and there's no excuse, however they rewrite history, God bless their hearts. Uh, but then, additionally, uh, we should always remember that America was in Afghanistan and liberated Afghanistan from Taliban terrorists because of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Uh, again, history should not be rewritten. What, her, what happened is Osama bin Laden was operating out of a cave in Afghanistan. And so uh, we would, and for 20 years indeed, our military was successful to protect. But sadly, we now, uh, by abandoning uh, Afghanistan, the global war on terrorism is not over. It's coming to America. The FBI has identified that we're at great risk of attack imminently today in America uh, that could occur. And so it, it's just shameful what occurred. Additionally, a question I have is that um, when on August 26, uh, 2021, when uh, President Biden uh, excused his appeasement and right in the middle of his speech, he was explaining his advisors uh, had said to just abandon, leave now. Uh, and then he threw in, it was not on the teleprompter, I have letters. Okay, I sent him and asked that night, I asked for copies of the letters of the advice that he received to abandon the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, it should not surprise you, about every two months, I send uh, a letter to the White House asking for the letters. There are no letters. Uh, they've not been revealed. But uh, what, what advice was given uh, by his advisors on uh, leaving the people of Afghanistan to fall off jets as the, as the abandonment took place? Well, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the, our military, uh, under the leadership of the president and uh, the chain of command, uh, did an admirable job uh, in a very difficult set of circumstances uh, to get as many people out, uh, some 125,000 people uh, were, were brought out. So uh, I associate myself with your praise of our military. I had the honor of serving with them in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and they have done an outstanding job uh, for the people of the United States for our security. With regard to what you mentioned, uh, sir, about the letters and advice, I do not have a direct knowledge of what it is that uh, uh, was involved there. But the advice uh, was to bring out as many people uh, as possible, to reach out to as many Americans and those who had worked for us or for organizations that uh, worked for us, uh, to bring them out. And, uh, and, and uh, a huge number was brought out. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Sherman. 
Throughout the relevant period, we had two choices. Keep a force there, particularly with air power, and be prepared to incur modest casualties or pull out. The foreign policy establishment wanted to stay. The dissent cables said stay. The politicians promised the American people we would pull out, not because our casualties were particularly large, but because they were on top of 20 years of war. <clears throat> we were defeated militarily in achieving our full goals in Afghanistan, not by the Taliban, <clears throat> but by the phrase forever war. Once that phrase was coined, the American people demanded we withdraw. Now, I know there's pressure on the chairman to politicize this committee and achieve the political objectives of his party. But this hearing is going to give politicization of uh, a, a bad name because it is the worst issue for the Republicans to bring up. Because, Ambassador, this agreement, this Doha agreement, is the worst agreement I could imagine. I don't blame you. Because President uh, Trump well, you had testified in your testimony. By the end of 2018, it was well known that President Trump's decision was to bring all American forces home from Afghanistan. In 2019, on the anniversary of 9-11, he invited them to Camp David. And just be <clears throat> before the November 20 ele 2020 election, the pre President Trump stated, we will have the small remaining number of our brave men and women serving in Afghanistan home by Christmas. So the only leverage you had over the Taliban is maybe we will take that foreign policy approach the, 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 and, and keep our Air Force capacity there. And you've got the President saying, President Trump saying, they're all home by Christmas, every single one of them. So this is uh, the worst agreement I could imagine just to, uh, Ambassador, is there anything in the agreement where uh, the Taliban commit themselves to uh, allowing 13 year old girls to go to school? I didn't find anything like that. Do you, is there in there? Uh, the Taliban, uh, there is nothing in the agreement. Uh, the issues dealing with the future of Afghanistan was to be negotiated. To be negotiated, but the agreement the itself, the, the purpose of this hearing sides. is to say, why didn't we enforce the agreement? Right. But when the Taliban, treats 12-year-old girls like sex slaves, when they kill members of the LGBT community, when they kill anyone who converts from Islam to Christianity, they are not in violation of this agreement that we are having a hearing to saying, why are we enforcing? They're not in violation, you can't enforce. We entered into agreement in which they agreed to do nothing more than talk to the Afghan government. Right. They talked, they decided, they wanted to kill LGBTQ community. They wanted to kill what they call apostates. They wanted to basically enslave uh, half the human race, the female half. So uh, this agreement was so bad that the chairman attacks President Biden for not withdrawing from it. This is an agreement entered into by the man who claims he's the best negotiator in the world, President Trump. Um, I will say that we did achieve one objective, and that is Afghanistan is not uniquely situated to serve as a base for terrorism against America. And uh, in fact, there's been more terrorism coming out of Afghanistan killing Iranians in Iran than killing Americans. Um, there's no such thing as a easy withdrawal. Russia, as the ambassador pointed out, Russia and Britain uh, had very messy withdrawals from Afghanistan and our withdrawal from Vietnam uh, was messy as well. That was particularly true when every English-speaking Afghan I had any acquaintance with was trying to leave the idea that the average grunt uh, in, the, in Afghanistan would stay and fight uh, is absurd. But I do have one more question, and that is the Republicans have said that somehow we should have gone all over Afghanistan and collected our $85 billion worth of weapons, presumably from people who knew that they could keep them for their own self-defense or sell them to the Taliban. Could we have by force, taken back our weapons everywhere in Afghanistan on our way out without casualties? Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, as you know, uh, the weapons that were left behind were weapons 
that we thought was safe to leave behind for the government of Afghanistan. Even Since, if we had realized the government was useless, could we have seized them without casualties? Now I, we are, in, are speculating because the government, uh, uh, we assume, would not uh, uh, it, fall apart. Ambassador, it was more of a rhetorical question. So, if people uh, have weapons they want to hold on to, you can't take them away if you're not willing to incur some casualties. I yield back. No one yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, I'm over here. Uh, in September of 2020, uh, you appeared before the House Oversight Committee and testified that the U.S. troop withdrawal would be determined based, and I'm, I'm going to quote you, based on conditions on the ground and delivery by the Taliban on their commitment. Um, did you or Secretary Blinken advocate for an extension on the withdrawal date considering the poor planning behind the final evacuation as it, as it occurred? As I said, sir, uh, four months were added to the timetable, uh, uh, moving from 14 to 18, but at, uh, as I said again, uh, the, the decision was made uh, to withdraw at the end of August and not to link it to uh, any uh, uh, conditions uh, that uh, you might have in mind. Well, that was your quote, conditions. So I think Americans have in mind that it would be a condition-based withdrawal, which makes sense. You provide some kind of, when I say you, our adversary, so to speak, you provide some level of um, compliance with the agreement that we can see, and then we'll give you a little. But that's, that's not what can, occurred. I, I'm just wondering if you can name a single concession made by the Taliban during the time period between the April 14th announcement by the president, by President Biden of total withdrawal and the fall of Afghanistan, what, what concessions? Well, one concession was uh, that uh, they acquiesced to the addition of four months uh, that we demanded. Of four and what? Four months was four demanded months. of additional uh, uh, time. They could have rejected it and gone back to fighting. They didn't. Uh, they acquiesced. Uh, two, they agreed not to enter Kabul uh, uh, when we asked. They agreed to sit and agree to a, a, a government with, uh, that would include the members of the Republican side, the government side. So, uh, but those agreements, as you know, were hollow because they took more and more and more of the government under their control, which was not in the Doha agreement, which was not what was considered, which was not, which was not what was agreed to. Well, they, and they did invade Kabul. Uh, well, they, 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 they did because they agreed not to, and then they, and there so was they, to be So they lied to us. So that wasn't based, so the withdrawal was not based on conditions on the ground. And I'm wondering, did you convey these concerns to President Biden during the continuing negotiations about the blatant violations? Blatant, they were blatant, but the whole world saw them as they were occurring. Certainly, uh, I'm not here to... Uh, defend the behavior of the Talibs uh, or the Taliban. None of us are, I get that. Uh, and, but I believe that uh, um, I'm trying insisting to on additional conditions. Uh, We're not asking for additional conditions, just the conditions that they agreed to. And I'm trying to determine knowing that, you knew that, Sure. the world saw that, right. the president saw that, I'm assuming Maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm assuming you advised him of that. The secretary advised him of that, but he proceeded anyway. That's he, he proceeded uh, to uh, withdraw forces because he believed if he persisted, it would be back uh, to, to, a, to, to a fight. And he didn't want to do that. So just out of curiosity in the remaining time, who chose the 20th anniversary of 9-11? as the final evacuation day? I actually do not know that. Uh, Did you ever uh, question that? I mean, maybe it's not as important and impactful to you as it for, for the rest of Americans, but that's pretty significant. 
uh, I agree with that, but I think that therefore an adjustment was made to the end of August uh, as the final date of withdrawal. But it was September 11th. The initial announcement, it was, as you know, as well as I do, but I think- You don't know who made the decision. I do not. Well, the president uh, obviously made the decision, but I don't know uh, uh, who advised them on choosing that well, date. Well, the president's the commander in chief, regardless of right. who advised them. Now, it was said that the president wanted to withdraw, and you even kind of just reminded us because it was to protect American lives and to lessen the loss of American lives. But you would also concede that the time coming into that, during the previous administration, there had been no loss of American lives. And once the decision was made, and, and the, the plan executed, there was a horrific loss of American lives. Well, uh, the, uh, the loss of life that didn't occur under President Trump's We'll never know what didn't occur, sir. What we know did occur, and that the previous administration's plan coming into it, during that period of time, a long period of time, there were no loss of American service members' lives. Because of the agreement. No, no, it wasn't because of the agreement. The Taliban wasn't following the agreement or abiding by the agreement. Well, it was because the president let the Taliban know that if they killed an American lives, it was gonna be over for them. No, no, I, I yield the balance. Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, uh, as a uh, uh, Gold Star family member myself, my uncle was killed in action. I just want to uh, recognize and thank uh, the families that are here. Uh, I want to be sure we thank first and foremost uh, and give our eternal gratitude uh, to their service and their sacrifice. Uh, purpose of undertaking the overall investigation of Afghanistan was to look to 20 plus years and to try and find out lessons learned, uh, things that uh, we could do differently. And the goal is, and I think I share it, and I'm sure the families here share it, to prevent future lives from being lost. Can we learn something over this period of time that will save other families and save other brave Americans uh, from that sacrifice? So that's my goal over 20 years looking at this. And, and I can't really sit here at this moment in time talking about saving future American lives without just uh, indicating something else that's happening right here in this house right now, and that's not acting on uh, aid to Ukraine. Why is that relevant to this? Because uh, when we can fund uh, Ukrainians defending themselves uh, against uh, an illegal war from a Russia that's a direct and present danger to the United States and our allies. And we can confront this threat with funding Ukraine. And by doing that, uh, confront Russia, deter other threats, threats that could be in China and Taiwan in the process, and keep young American men and women from being deployed under Article 5. Uh, if Ukraine falls, Putin has made it clear he is going into the Baltic states, which are NATO states. So as in the theme of trying to save future American lives, I hope that the, the speaker has the courage to even allow democracy that so many people fought for a chance to have a vote uh, on this. Now, when it comes to uh, Ukraine, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you know, I didn't get to choose who's here. Uh, I didn't get to choose the title uh, that says the Biden administration failed Again, I, I prefer to look at this over 20 years, plus years. But I would quote, uh, given the comments of some of my colleagues, a quote from former U.S. Ambassador John Bass, who said our main policy efforts, and he was the ambassador, as you're aware, he was. Uh, under President Trump. Uh, our main policy efforts not only didn't re reinforce each other, they contradicted each other. These contradictory signals were amplified by President Trump's periodic statements supporting rapid force reductions. Taken together, they undermined Afghans' confidence in a U.S. security commitment and in their own armed service and government, something that you alluded to, Mr. Ambassador, that the lack of confidence that spelled itself out uh, with the Afghan government and their military. Uh, I guess I'll just leave with this and, and hope that we can undertake as a committee uh, 
really our emphasis on what went wrong, what we can learn, learn from our military, learn from our diplomats. There was plenty that went wrong, and it had dire consequences in many instances. But in terms of limiting this hearing to how the Biden administration failed, uh, I'll just end with one quote. And that quote occurred on June 26th, 2021. It was at a political campaign rally afterwards by the former president. And he, and quote, I started this process. All the troops are coming home. They couldn't stop this process, unquote. So let's not have this hearing uh, center on uh, who is the last person holding the ball when the music uh, ended, but rather sincerely looking at what we can do uh, to prevent other tragedies, uh, what we can learn from this, and how we can save young American men and women from being in harm's way when they don't have to be. They have the courage to be there when they have to be. The decisions that are made are not there. I'll never forget uh, when I first became a congressman, I went to one of our uh, members serving, uh, you know, in a war zone, uh, and I asked him what he thought about the war, and he said, well, sir, my job is to serve. Okay. That question is yours to answer, respectfully. That's why we're here. That's why we're trying to learn. That's why we're trying to save more American lives in the future. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. I thank the chairman, I thank the ambassador for, for being here and for his service. Uh, today, uh, more than two years after the Biden administration's shameful, tragic, and utterly misguided flight from Afghanistan, it has become clear that the president was determined to abandon the country at any cost and with no conditions. The cost in lost military assets and our credibility as a friend and ally and global leader, and most of all, in precious American lives, was incalculable. Again and again, the administration proved that it was willing to simply cede Afghanistan to the Taliban, irrespective of the Taliban's clear intent to ignore all commitments and agreements. The responsibility the absolute debacle in Afghanistan rests on this administration's shoulders, period. And there must be accountability. There has been no accountability for the administration's total failure to protect U.S. troops and citizens. Ambassador Gilazad, did countries in NATO argue against a full U.S. troop withdrawal? Uh, they did. They did. Uh, subject to a political agreement, that, uh, as I mentioned to the chairman. Hmm. How did Russia and China respond to the Taliban takeover? I, I don't know for sure, uh, uh, but uh, it seems to me uh, that they w would have uh, preferred a political settlement, they stated at least that they uh, would have preferred a political settlement. I was always suspicious of their motivations. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they would uh, want a political settlement, but they knew that there is no easy path to a political settlement. They also would have liked to have kept us in Afghanistan in a difficult situation doing what they wanted us to do in part, which is to get the uh, terrorists that were focused on them eliminated by us and paying a price without winning. Uh, so we had to, uh, to uh, be careful uh, in terms of Ambassador, uh, Russian I, I, and I, I, I know that this was Chinese touched on before. But yes. And Afghanistan I could talk some more if we were in a different setting about the, the, their their policies, but this is what I can say Thank in this, you. In this Thank setting. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and it's more concerning to me that NATO was against uh, yeah. a full troop withdrawal. Right. Uh, Af uh, Afghanistan, and this was touched on, is now ranked worst of 177 countries in terms of the status of women, according to the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Did you believe the Taliban would respect women's rights and allow girls to go to school? 
I did not uh, trust them. Uh, they did make uh, statements on record, uh, video statements, uh, that they would allow girls to go to school, uh, to all the way to not only college, but to a PhD. Uh, this is on the record that they have made. But, but they didn't do they it. They have not lived up to it. You didn't do it. They didn't do it, didn't and do you didn't it. trust them. Right. Why didn't U.S. negotiators press the Taliban to extend the withdrawal date beyond August 31 to facilitate the evacuation? That was, uh, of course, the president's decision not to uh, yet ask for four months, uh, as I mentioned before, but that was his decision not to ask for an additional extension. President Biden's. President Biden, yes. Taliban issued threats to attack U.S. troops if they stayed longer than the August 31 deadline. Ambassador, did you consider this to be the actions of a responsible partner of peace? Well, that consideration uh, that if an additional extension was asked for, uh, it wasn't asked, but if an additional extension was asked for, perhaps it could lead to this restart of the fight, and that's why and uh, 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 perhaps the decision was made not to ask for more time. Well, they threatened our U.S. troops right. if they stayed one day longer right. than August 31. What was your assessment throughout 2021 uh, of whether the Taliban would, was meeting the conditions of the Doha Agreement? And uh, how about in April of 2021? Well, it always was my personal judgment that to get the Taliban to do what they have agreed to do, we have to respond with our commitments in a way that incentivizes them to do what they have committed to do, meaning that we wouldn't do what we have committed to unless they do what they have committed to doing. Um, uh, that was my point of view, and uh, that was my advice. My time has uh, 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 ended here, and I yield back. Thank you. Anyway, yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador, for your testimony. Uh, today. Uh, in your prepared testimony, you said, quote, by the end of 2018, as is well known, the president's decision was to bring home American forces from Afghanistan. Uh, we've also heard testimony in multiple closed-door transcribed interviews with senior State Department officials to this effect. In other words, that the withdrawal of all U.S. troops all, the withdrawal of all U.S. troops from Afghanistan began in February 2020 as part of the agreement you negotiated between the United States and the Taliban. Can you provide examples of how President Trump's decision to withdraw all U.S. troops was apparent and, quote, well known beginning in 2018? Well, and the, the, uh, the president uh, tweeted to that effect multiple times. Uh, I would give uh, a reference to Secretary Pompeo's book uh, uh, in which he uh, documents uh, uh, the president's determination. Uh, and uh, of course, when I had my meetings uh, with the president, he always made that clear uh, that that was the objective. So let me ask you, so it's fair to say the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan began as a result of the February 2020 Doha agreement under President Trump? Indeed. And do you believe that sentiment to withdraw all troops was known or suspected by the Taliban when you were negotiating with them? And what informs this belief? Well, the public statements, uh, sometimes the Taliban would uh, say that I was not following in my negotiations the, the letter of uh, or the spirit of what was being said publicly uh, by saying, we would only withdraw if certain conditions are met. Why sometimes statements would be made uh, that provided, that created the impression as if we would, would withdraw regardless. Uh, so, so you uh, feel like that was undermining at the time you're negotiating? Well, but that's for others to judge, but the, the challenge is as I described. The challenge was as I described. And so, and, and how did that fact, how did that situation, the conflicting statements and so forth, the fact that the Taliban had a sense at least or suspected that uh, there would be a total withdrawal, how did that affect your ability to negotiate the Doha deal with them? It was, it was not helpful, um, uh, but also, um, however, 
I try to educate them uh, not to uh, take public statements made for uh, a variety of reasons uh, uh, as the definitive final word because uh, uh, circumstances could change uh, that we needed a good agreement as good as possible given uh, the statements that were being made uh, uh, because without uh, having such an agreement uh, they might hear a statement uh, very different than the, the statement. From the president or the secretary of state or some high-ranking U.S. official. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and you negotiated this deal. Was there ever any doubt that what it committed the United States to do was to draw down its military fully from the country? Basically, to go to zero. Yeah. That was uh, uh, clearly in the agreement, but... Uh, uh, the idea of perhaps leaving some forces behind was there, uh, not in the agreement. Uh, we had raised it uh, with the Talibs. Uh, it became uh, an understanding, uh, I have to be careful how to articulate this, uh, that if there is an agreement between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban, and there is a new uh, unity government, the issue of a residual U.S. presence uh, would be decided by that government. But as well, Talib, I guess, they could never agree to uh, sure. uh, themselves. Uh, uh, let me uh, ask you, so in light of these facts to which you've testified, would it be reasonable to say that the withdrawal began in 2020? Right. And that it wasn't, that, that it wasn't the sole decision of one U.S. president in 2021? I, I agreed. Uh, the Trump administration initiated the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan by negotiating and ultimately concluding the Doha deal in February 2020 with an explicit aim to withdraw all American troops in the country in 14 months. Right. The Trump administration's implementation of this deal set in motion the formal U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Agreed. I would advise that if we could think about withdrawal and then the way the final phase of withdrawal happened. Uh, th that's, the, 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 I think, a distinction that we should keep in mind. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, so time has expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. I'd start by touching on the last statement that you just said. There's uh, the withdrawal, and then there's essentially the way that it is conducted. You could say that about any sporting event, any athletic event, anything that you're planning on doing in the future. Uh, you know, you might plan to have a, a Super Bowl, but there's the way that the game is played. Yeah. And that's what ultimately counts, right. is what do you do when you get onto the ground, as they say, where the metal meets the meat. Right. So I want to ask a few questions about that. And I want to ask a few questions about the conditions for the Biden administration. Did the Biden administration execute or operate on a plan that there are no conditions? There's, there's no line, no threshold, no red line, anything that was going to prevent them from being out of Afghanistan on the day they wanted. Let me understand what you're asking. Um, that certainly uh, the desire to... Uh, complete the withdrawal by the end of August was that any stay beyond that risks the restart of the war, which was the driving factor, uh, uh, as I understood it. So there, uh, to say it again, I'm not going to try to put words in your mouth, was there anything that was going to stop them from leaving on the day that they wanted to leave? I, that would be speculating, uh, of course. But I, I, I would restate that avoiding the restart of the war was the most important factor shaping decisions. I wonder if, in fact, it would be speculating or, or not be speculating, because uh, as you have spoken about, as you have been questioned about, and as you offered up in, in interviews previously, you made your recommendations to the administration. Right. And you said, you know, listen, there's continuation of expecting uh, full adherence with the provisions, the conditions of the Doha Agreement. That's a recommendation, and I believe that was your recommendation. 
make the Taliban uphold to those provisions. There's scrap the Doha agreement as though it never existed and create your own conditions, President Biden, and tell the Taliban this is what you want. Right. Or there is forget about the conditions of the Doha agreement and one way or another, you're leaving when you want to leave. Right. He chose, my understanding is, forget the conditions of the agreement. We're leaving when we want to leave. We're leaving on the date that we demand to leave. We're not, we're not leaving on any other date. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the additional four months was the only uh, uh, factor that, may, uh, that changed from the, uh, the timetable. Otherwise, uh, uh, you're right. And we know he chose September 11 to begin with. I'm just going to ask one more question. Do you know who pays the price ultimately for bad foreign policy? All of us. Who? Especially the armed forces, of course. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I want to associate how many people, myself with all the comments. How many people that, paid the price for his bad foreign policy? Well, if, uh, of course, uh, ISIS uh, attacked. Uh, we knew that uh, uh, they, they were out to attack, uh, and we demanded uh, steps by the Taliban to preclude or prevent the attack. And General McKenzie, on the record, has said uh, that uh, despite the fact that he's very hostile towards the Taliban, uh, uh, that they did everything we asked for. So it was an ISIS attack that killed uh, 13 brave Americans. Uh, and the Taliban-US cooperation to prevent that did not succeed. Thank you for the time today. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentleman Yields, Chair recognizes Mr. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, uh, on June 26, 2021, a person at a rally said this. Tell me who said this. I started the process. All the troops are coming back home. They couldn't stop the process. 21 years is enough, don't you think? 21 years, they couldn't stop the process. All right. I suspect that's President Trump. That's correct. Yeah. So doesn't that suggest that he was acknowledging that the process he started could not be stopped without some consequences? I can't speculate, uh, uh, but he was about uh, whether others could stop it, although it's my judgment that President Biden, if he wanted to, uh, he, he could have. That's my well, personal Let me ask you this. You just said a few minutes ago to Ms. Wagner when she was asking you about the Taliban's commitment to education of women mm -hmm. virtually that we have to live up to our obligation in order to make them live up to theirs. You're right. Now, what if we had not withdrawn those troops? What if we had not lived up to our obligation? Wouldn't that have had consequences that uh, were not what were desirable? Didn't, hadn't they already stopped uh, attacking U.S. troops before this? And if we had left troops there, or we had not m met our obligation, who knows what they would have done? You're absolutely right. Okay, so we can speculate that whatever they would have done probably wouldn't have been good because the chairman said, I can't trust the Taliban, or we can't uh, trust the Taliban. And you said, I do not trust the Taliban. Uh, so uh, why did we enter into an agreement with the Taliban with no accountability measures, no way to hold them to their commitments? Well, if we can't we, trust we, them. We enter agreements, uh, we're talking about international politics uh, with people that we don't trust. We did it during arms control with the Soviets. Remember, President Reagan said, trust but verify. Right. And the way to incentivize uh, the other side when you have an agreement to adhere is that you won't do what they want from you unless they do what they have agreed to doing. For, uh, so th that's the way uh, it works. And then you have your information system to monitor. Are they living up to the agreement or, the, or not? And then you bring that information into the negotiation and the implementation of the agreement. Well, did you have any way to monitor what they were doing? Absolutely. We had, to, wait, maybe not perfectly. We, we did have uh, 
We did have uh, information. We, in fact, did reports, uh, my office did, with the Department of Defense together on, for example, what were they doing in terms of terrorism, uh, what they had agreed uh, with us uh, to do or not to do, and then what they were doing, and we were sending those reports out. Let me up. ask you about that, since you mentioned terrorism. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we made the deal that they were no longer going to be a base or a support for terrorism, and yet didn't we find the al-Qaeda leader, uh, al-Zawahiri, there and take sure. him out in I a with a drone, so obviously they weren't up living up to that obligation. Right. That was a, uh, violations happen in agreement, that was a flagrant violation. Yes, it was. Uh, and then we uh, took the action, and that we, we did. And well, how I, did you uh, miss that, if you were monitoring, and I mean, when... Well, uh, we, we obviously, this happened after the withdrawal had been completed. So the monitoring system worked, we found them, and then we took action that the Talibs said we shouldn't have, but uh, we had made it clear that uh, we would do what's necessary to protect the American people. And, and we took the action that the president did, and I applauded that action. Well, what else have uh, they done that we caught through any kind of monitoring that was Well, we are, we, are, we, are, we are watching their... Uh, uh, counterterrorism uh, commitments, the, the implementation of it, and uh, I'm not in the government now, and you, you can, uh, I'm sure, see reports that they do. From what I see on the outside now, and this is my opinion, it appears that we believe they are largely adhering uh, to, those, uh, to those commitments. But not to the education of women, apparently. Uh, if we had left some troops there, like some people have suggested we should have done, do you not think that would have had consequences for what the, uh, they would have done uh, aside from the Doha Agreement? If we had violated our half, our part, and left some troops there, you think they'd have just said, oh, well, okay. I, I, the judgment was, and you obviously rely on a lot of people, intelligence uh, on uh, coming to a judgment was that we'll be back uh, and uh, to fighting if we did that. Uh, if we unilaterally said we are not withdrawing all our forces, although we agreed that we would, uh, uh, and uh, that we may be back uh, in fighting. And, uh, and as I said, the President Biden decided to withdraw all the forces. Uh, Did you, do you agree with that, or you thought we should well, leave I, it there I, I, I supported the idea that uh, not going back to war, and, uh, yeah. uh, but whether one would have uh, reopened some negotiations, that's something different to... I on think the, the American the, people didn't want us to go back to war. Yeah. Yeah. Thank time you. has expired. Yeah. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you for your service to our country, and I appreciate your testimony today. Hopefully it helps us learn what we can from Afghanistan and apply it, not just to provide accountability and truth for the record, and, but for action in the future. So. I spent my life uh, from 18 to 30 in the Army. I was fortunate to get to serve in the 75th Ranger Regiment, and one of the core missions that we trained on was non-combatant evacuation operations. Mm -hmm. In none of those training scenarios, and I never did it live, we trained for it, but in Afghanistan, that was the mission. It was a non-combatant evacuation operation. In no training scenario that I'm aware of did we have a plan to ever take the military out first, and then hope that somehow the civilians would get out. Have you ever heard of such a doctrine anywhere? Well, of course, I, uh, I applaud you for your service. I have uh, had the great honor of serving with our brave men and women in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they have inspired me, and I very much uh, associate myself with what you said. I think the problem was, in my judgment, and I said it before, is that they, we planned for a single scenario, and that scenario was that the government and its troops would uh, survive our withdrawal and for some time thereafter. And that's what informed 
Uh, I think the sequencing, uh, that's my judgment. So you do believe sequencing. that the State Department actually believed that they would trust the lives of American citizens to the Taliban? Because they weren't there themselves. Frankly, they were ready to get out of town. Um, and they thought that uh, we could get ourselves out, we can get the military out, and we'll just trust the Taliban to finish the job? That was the plan? Uh, the, it was to work with the government uh, of Afghanistan, with the troops of the Afghan government that we had trained and equipped to uh, deal with the withdrawal period and then for a period after the withdrawal. The plan was to maintain some forces after the withdrawal was completed in, at, at Kabul airport and to protect the embassy. Yeah. And I believe that assumption, uh, and uh, I, I keep repeating that because several of your colleagues are mentioning lessons learned, is that we don't plan, as one lesson that I have learned uh, from the outside is for a single scenario. We have to plan for more alternative scenarios and how we would adjust from one to the other. Well, if, regardless of how many alternatives we had, that seemed like a particularly bad plan. Right. And now with the benefit of hindsight, I think everyone can agree that it was in fact a bad plan. Um, in retrospect, it, it, it does. Uh, it is, was problematic, but I, I, I explained to you what the assumption was. I understand. I understand. And uh, but in 2004, you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post titled uh, "Quote Afghanistan's Milestone," uh, which I would like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman. This op-ed covered the country's approval of a new of a new constitution. Right. However, I want to read uh, aloud some sentences that you wrote. "Quote Afghanistan." has sent a compelling message to the rest of the world that by investing in that country's development, the United States is investing in success. Americans can take pride in the role that we played in leading the multilateral effort to support Afghan democratization. President Bush's decision to increase aid to Afghanistan, which will likely total more than $2 billion in fiscal 20, 2004, will accelerate reconstruction of the country's national army, police force, economic infrastructure, schools, and medical system. You finish this op-ed by writing, quote, our work in Afghanistan is not yet done. It will take several years in sustained commitment of significant resources by the United States and the international community before the country can stand on its own feet. Given the stakes involved, we must remain committed for as long as it takes, I've heard that phrase before, to succeed. Do you think we were successful? And without objection, it's entered into the record. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, what can we learn about nation building? It seems pretty foolish to me. I'll admit it seemed foolish at the time. Um, well, I, um, I have to say I supported President Bush's uh, vision uh, for uh, transforming not only Afghanistan, but the broader Middle East. His vision was uh, that that problem of that region was... F the goals are always nice. Right. And if we judge things by what people say right. they aspire to, it always it sounds so good. That was but the execution is problematic. And I will say that, frankly, that same phrase, as long as it takes, as much as it takes, yes. is the only public plan the Biden administration has laid out for Ukraine. And other than that, right. I don't see right. any tie to Ukraine here. I, I yield back. I John, uh, yields back. Uh, Ms. Wilde is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Ambassador, thank you so much for thank your you. testimony here today. Before I begin my question, I just want us all to take a moment to remember the 13 U.S. service members who lost their lives on August 26th of 2021 while conducting the evacuation. I know that every member of this committee joins me in paying tribute to their families as well as to the families of all service members who put their lives on the line over the course of our country's longest war. We will continue to honor them and we will never forget their sacrifices. On, on August 26th of 2021, I spent much of the day on the phone with a constituent, a mother, whose son had um, very abruptly been sent to Afghanistan to assist in the evacuation. He was at, stationed at the airport, and she didn't hear from him the entire day. And you can mm. imagine the, um, the, the stress and anxiety that she had um, as we got the news that service members had been lost. So I will never forget that. Um, and, you know, it's our obligation 
um, when we send men and women in uniform into harm's way, that we continually ensure that they have the support that they need and that the mission they're being asked to conduct is, is in our national interest and is achievable. Um, and that their partners on the ground are willing to make the same kind of sacrifices that our troops are making every day. Um, so I, I, my question I think is simple, <laughs> um, but it's probably a complicated answer. It deals with the fundamental underlying reality here. Why over the course of 20 years in Afghanistan did administrations of both parties fail to correctly assess the level of dedication and cohesion of the Afghan forces and its political leadership? Well, that's obviously an excellent question. And there are lessons to be learned that we have to uh, focus sharply on that. We spent a lot of resources, uh, a lot of effort, uh, the forces were of varying qualities. Um, they sacrificed a lot, uh, some 70,000 perhaps, 60 to 70,000 Afghan soldiers and policemen died during no the question. period we were there. Um, but what happened to them, uh, our assessment was that they would do a lot better uh, after uh, our withdrawal. Understood, but my real question is, how did we fail so yes, badly that, that, at that, that, that over the 20 years? I mean, did. we know that there was a division in the intelligence com right. community with the CIA yeah. on one side right. and the Pentagon on the other side on the effect of, right. uh, effectiveness of training the Afghan forces. Right. Um, and I don't, I'm not asking you to go into classified information in right. a public setting, but can you speak broadly to these yeah. divergent perspectives and what interests they may have been driven by? Uh, one is perhaps the way we built the armed forces needs to be uh, questioned. Uh, many people would argue that the Afghans teaching them how to fight shouldn't uh, have been a, a difficult task. And the, the, the way we organize them perhaps to fight, uh, their uh, recruitment, sustainment, uh, organization, maybe uh, were not appropriate. Uh, for the circumstances, uh, perhaps they, uh, that would be one. Uh, second would be to what extent politics uh, and the divisions in the country uh, affected uh, uh, the force. I was very concerned. I spent a lot of time in, the, uh, in uh, uh, 2020 uh, because two candidates announced themselves as presidents, two presidents. and. Here was a possible scenario in which the f some forces were going to go with one candidate, the, the forces we had invested so much in, and some would have gone with the other, and you would have had already you had the war with the Talibs, uh, and then you would have another war inside the Republic side. So uh, th there are lessons to be learned. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, well, I'm just going to stop you there because I only have another 30 sure. seconds. But my, I have a very deep concern that from Vietnam to Afghanistan to Iraq, right. and who knows in the current uh, situation in the world, we keep seeing politicization of intelligence right. to sort of fit a pre-designed agenda. Um, and it, it, what seems to be a cherry picking of intelligence and data that administrations may use to tell the story that they want to tell, not necessarily the reality. And that's what I want to see us get away from. With that, I thank you very much. I'm Good. sorry we don't have more time, and I yield back. Emily yields. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman, for holding today's hearing. And I want to thank you, Ambassador, for making yourself available um, you. and coming before our committee today. Um, since the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan under Biden administration, all heartfelt progress on basic freedoms and rights for Afghan women have vanished. Women made incredible gains in the classroom, played an active role in the Afghan government and free press, and participated in the workforce side by side with their male coworkers. When the Taliban seized power, one of their first actions was to ban girls from attending secondary school. They eliminated the Afghan Commission to eliminate violence against women, banned women from working at NGOs, and started restricting women's access to public areas. 
Decades of work on women and girls went down the drain in a matter of weeks. As a woman, this is deeply personal to me. It has been raised several times today that you presented the uh, administration with several power sharing proposals that would give the Taliban partial or majority control of the Afghan government. So what did these peace plans say about women's rights and participation in the Afghan government? We did give one plan uh, to accelerate the, the negotiations since we wanted to see uh, the, op the optimal outcome or the better option would have been an agreement before withdrawal was completed. And in, in those uh, uh, draft proposals, Afghanistan's adherence to international standards on human rights, respect for the rights of all Afghan citizens, men, women, minorities, children were all specified. But in our, the draft that we shared with them to, uh, uh, to uh, assist with accelerating our, uh, the, the negotiations. Ambassador, yes. did you think that the Taliban would be willing to share power of the Afghan government with women? Well, we uh, 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 had them uh, say to us, and they say that the publicly and on videos, that uh, uh, women could be ministers, women could be uh, um, uh, active in all uh, parts of life. Uh, the, uh, what has happened since uh, has been a violation of those statements that are on the record, no, uh, not to me Say alone, they, but uh, yeah, to, the, to the whole follow. world that they, yeah. they said that. So Their words and actions didn't match. Right. You know, the Taliban was often cited as stating to the United States, you might have the watches, but we have the time. Right. Was the Taliban waiting the United States government out so it could overthrow the Afghan government after our departure? Well, I'd be speculating, but certainly they waited us out uh, in the sense that uh, based on what happened, based on changes in the world, based on successes that we had on counterterrorism, uh, as I've described, we decided uh, that it's time to come home. And uh, 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 there are things we could have done differently in retrospect. Those studies will be done that would have uh, perhaps I had a different outcome in terms of the Taliban. Ambassador, One issue as ambassador. You, ambassador, did yeah, you consider so. that as a possibility if power sharing agreement was implemented? I, I, I certainly considered it as a possibility because both sides were saying they want that. And the question was uh, the terms. Uh, the president of Afghanistan, President Ghani, did not want to leave office. Uh, he wanted the Talibs to join them. They said, no, they won't join. There has to be a new government uh, that uh, be formed with a head that's acceptable to both sides. So the, the negotiations uh, were difficult. Uh, there was, uh, we knew it was going to take time. You know, the, the, the war had you been going think, on there for uh, 40 The President years. Biden's unconditional withdrawal legitimized the Taliban's plan of action. No, our withdrawal, uh, of course, um, uh, changed the balance in favor of the Taliban. Um, but I believe that the bigger mistake uh, or the bigger factor that, uh, uh, that shaped uh, uh, the outcome was the poor performance of the government, uh, of the Afghan government. And uh, running away uh, while saying that they, this will, they will never do that, the disintegration of the armed forces, those were the bigger factors, uh, in my judgment, in terms of what ultimately happened. Well, there was no doubt we saw. Chair Lee Yields, yeah. uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Manning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witness for being here with us today. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I have to be honest with you. Like many Americans, I was shocked when I read the February 2020 Trump-Doha agreement by how few conditions there were for the Taliban to meet. There were no protections for women and girls in Afghanistan or for the Afghan people who had helped us and worked side by side with our forces. Basically, the former president agreed to a precipitous withdrawal of all troops, 
all coalition partners and all civilian personnel by May 1st to release 5,000 prisoners to work with the UN to lift sanctions against the Taliban to seek economic cooperation for the reconstruction of Afghanistan and to refrain from the threat or use of force against Afghanistan or intervene. For our 5,000, they agreed to release 1,000. They vaguely committed to enter intra-Afghan negotiations and agreed not to allow its members to attack our personnel on the way out. I did not see any agreement to stop attacks against Afghans. I did not see any agreement to prevent them from taking Afghan territory. And I certainly did not see any protection of Afghan women and girls. I did not see any guarantees that Afghanistan would prosecute anyone who commits atrocities against women or girls. I did not see any requirement that the Taliban take steps to keep women and girls in schools. I did not see any requirement that the Taliban take steps to uphold any rights of the Afghan people. Apparently, the protection of women and girls was not important to President Trump. Given the terrible reality that we see today in Afghanistan, including for Afghan women and girls, in retrospect, what should have been done differently to secure protections for vulnerable minority populations, and in particular, women and girls in Afghanistan? Well, uh, the, the key issue uh, for you and for our other leaders is whether achieving the goals that you outline on women should have been a precondition for withdrawal, which means uh, that the U.S. forces would have given the responsibility to achieve those rights, that we should have stayed in Afghanistan until the Taliban agreed to those. To protect women and girls. Right. And was that, and ever, were you, you ever instructed I, uh, on behalf I, of uh, President Trump the, to the, secure and, those agreements? And the judgment was uh, that uh, to pursue those objectives with other means, other the use of armed forces. Because there are lots of violations of human rights around the world, and it's not the, uh, the responsibility of the U.S. forces of human to go rights. We're talking to about war. we're talking about half the population of the country. Right. Was it ever articulated that one of the goals of withdrawal was to make sure that Afghan women and girls were right. going to be protected? That, was that, that ever articulated as that, a goal of the Trump administration? It was articulated that that would be pursued in the inter-Afghan negotiations, during which, and we have a written agreement with the. Uh, in which it states that we would work with the government which supported human rights, the legitimate government of Afghanistan, to pursue those objectives in the inter-Afghan negotiations using diplomacy, using the future relations. So you weren't going to negotiate that with the Taliban. My, you were going to help behind the scenes the Afghan, Afghan government, government that uh, collapsed. Uh, you were going to encourage them to work to support yeah, women which and girls. The assumption was, it turns out to be wrong, ma'am, that the government will not collapse, uh, that it had big, more forces and uh, numbers, more weapons, more international standing, more money. Uh, so that did it you would, ever, yeah. did you ever believe that the Taliban was truly interested in negotiating with the Afghan government? I, I saw them negotiate with the Afghan government uh, because the negotiations started uh, in September. But was that before you gave up all the leverage by by signing the agreement and, and frankly, by Donald Trump tweeting in advance what he was going to do in withdrawing our troops? I, as I said before, I mean, and there was disagreements, obviously, inside the administration and outside whether uh, the way the president decided to go was the right way. But the decision was made in our system, as you know, that president make the decision, others have expressed their opinions, the advisors, the decision was made not to link withdrawal on these other uh, On the protection that, of Afghan people and Afghan women and girls. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. No, I yield. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Baird. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here today. Appreciate all the work that you've done. 
You know, um, the question I have deals with uh, the many reports of sidebar agreements between the U.S. and the Taliban during the Doha. Uh, for instance, uh, after signing the deal, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo claimed that the Taliban would destroy al-Qaeda. Other reports indicated that the Taliban would enter negotiations with the Afghan government. So neither of these things really happened. So did you believe the Taliban would destroy the al-Qaeda, or what's your position? Well, the, the um, agreement says specifically, and you talked about the side agreement, uh, they're classified, there are two, uh, uh, and one deals with terrorism. I can't go into that in this setting, you, uh, uh, hopefully you've read it, was to not to allow uh, Al-Qaeda specifically, but terrorists that, uh, any terrorist that would threaten the security of the United States uh, and our allies. That was the, uh, uh, the agreement. Now, the Zawahiri case was a, a grave violation of that agreement. But as I said before, I'm not in government. You should ask the intelligence community of what uh, I believe, uh, based on what I read, that uh, we believe that... Uh, they're uh, uh, largely in compliance on that counterterrorism. Uh, with regard to uh, government negotiations, negotiation did start. Uh, the agreement necessitated the start of inter-Afghan negotiations. We assume it would take time. We would desire if it could be concluded before we left, but we didn't want to make it conditional uh, on, on, on uh, the withdrawal on a, an agreement because one side or the other uh, in the negotiations uh, would have uh, not wanted to conclude something uh, uh, and keep us there. The government, for example, could have uh, been interested in keeping us there uh, because the government didn't want us to withdraw the Afghan government. They liked the situation with the big American presence and support. So uh, as to uh, the assessment of who was more serious about negotiations, uh, um, I could speculate or I could give you my opinion, but, uh, uh, um, but we, the key point is that we didn't want the withdrawal of forces, a decision was made to leave conditioned on a decision by Afghans towards each other because we didn't know quite what their calculations would be and whether they, those calculations would assist with uh, uh, the timetable of withdrawal that the president uh, had in mind. Thank you. One more question. Uh, since you were involved in this so deeply, was the Biden administration made aware of these side agreements with uh, the absolutely. Taliban? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. So my last question deals with um, giving you the opportunity uh, to refresh us about your involvement in communications and so on in those final days before the fall yeah. of Kabul. I, I was uh, very much at the center of the storm, if you like. Uh, I was in Doha based those the final days. I would... Uh, uh, participate obviously with the president and others in meetings. Uh, I would was essentially the channel to get the Taliban to do what we wanted during those two weeks. Uh, we we wanted the door a road closed because we thought uh, ISIS K was gonna use that road to or to look uh, from that hill that uh, nearby they might shoot a rocket uh, at the airport. At this mosque there might uh, be a terrorist. Uh, to direct them to go uh, to to uh, to block the road, go up the hill, go to the uh, to the to the to the mosque, uh, and then uh, I would deal with people's movement. I would get calls. Uh, one thing I learned, sir, is that uh, how our society had gotten intermixed with the Afghan society. I would get calls from all over the United States saying, uh, this ex-person uh, used to drive my car and he wants to get to the airport. He's stuck uh, in this uh, place in Kabul. Please arrange for him to get to the airport. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, and then I will be in almost multiple uh, contacts daily with our military at the airport. I had put my deputy at the airport also with our military. And then the, uh, the military would call me, uh, uh, we want to see ex Talib. They are not reacting and responding to our messages. Can you talk to the big Talib leader, to uh, my brother, to uh, allow this to happen? So it was. Uh, a lot going on, uh, and then not to mention members of Congress calling, uh, asking for uh, movement think, of people. I think so, you have run out of time. So, <laughs> so I, I gave you too much information, yep. I think. Yes. And Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge me for just a second or so. Sure. I can't help but uh, share my experience about uh, soldiers, men and women who put the uniform on, and we had one of those young 13, right from my district. And so I can't help but, but recognize the contribution that our people in uniform make around this world. And so, Absolutely. thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. We you, appreciate sir. your contribution as well in Vietnam. So, Chair now recognizes Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Baird, for those uh, good comments about our women and men serving our uh, country. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks, for holding this hearing today. I'd like to focus on our allies, those who risk everything, their safety, their family safety, to support the United States mission in Afghanistan. For two and a half years, our Afghan allies have been trapped in a frightening legal limbo, trapped because Congress has again and again failed to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act and make good on our promises. We even had an opportunity to pass parts of it in the Senate border deal just last week, a deal that extreme Republicans killed. Now, I've been fortunate to get those members of an especially vulnerable group, the Female Tactical Platoon, part of the Afghan National Army Special Operations Command. These brave women went through rigorous screening and training by the United States military. They participated in hundreds of direct action combat missions against the Taliban alongside US Special Forces, including Green Berets, Navy SEALs and Army Rangers. 42 FTPs, many of whom are part of the persecuted Hazara ethnic minority, were evacuated after Kabul fell. But the Taliban knows who they are. They know who the families are that they were forced to leave behind. And a constituent of mine, an Army captain who served in Afghanistan from 2016 to 2020, spent part of her deployment serving alongside the FT peace. She told me that, quote, threatening letters from the Taliban were sent to these women, warning that they will be dealt with so that they will serve as an example, unquote. She also said, quote, there is no doubt that these women would have been raped and tortured before death if they hadn't been evacuated by U.S. counterparts, unquote. Another active duty service member wrote to me, quote, the female tactical platoon holds some, hold some of the bravest women I have ever met. I am an American soldier, and these women fought by my side for nearly 10 years, targeting the enemies of the United States in Afghanistan. I trusted them with my life daily, and they entrusted me with theirs. When Afghanistan fell in August of 21, they did not want to lay down their arms and flee. They were forced to. As the Taliban encircled Kabul, they began to target the members of the female tactical platoon and their families. Their loved ones remained in danger. Their mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers were forced to stay behind since they are not considered, quote, immediate family. To this day, I receive messages from family members desperately seeking help. Many have been beaten, tortured, and killed. They need our help, unquote. That's from that active duty service member. In the words of an FTP herself residing in my home state of Arizona, who was kind enough to share her story with my office, quote, I can't give you my name for fear of reprisals against my family in Afghanistan. I served in the Afghan National Army Special Forces Female Tactical Platoon for five years. I speak five languages, spent a year and a half training with US and British forces before being assigned to the platoon. I would love to serve in the US Army. I left behind my father, mother, three sisters, three brothers, they are now subject of harassment, intimidation, and kidnapping at the hands of the Taliban because of my service with US forces, unquote. My sisters are in hiding for fear the Taliban will, quote, disappear them, as, they, as has happened to other FTP family members, even though they are 
Only my sisters, the Taliban, will exact revenge on anyone they can find who is related to me by blood. I fear for my family's lives every day, unquote. I share their words today to underscore the deadly consequences if this Congress continues to stall on the Afghan Adjustment Act. Every day that this Congress fails to act is a betrayal of our allies and of our American values. Ambassador, your thoughts on the Afghan Adjustment Act. I, I'm, uh, I appreciate what you said, uh, Congressman. I'm not familiar with this act, uh, so uh, therefore I'm not in a position to offer an opinion on it. I appreciate your diplomatic answer to that. Uh, for your information, yeah, as you would expect, this would allow uh, the female Plata platoons and others that served alongside the U.S. military who are temporarily yeah. uh, have immigration status in the United States to be given yeah. permanent status yeah. here in the United States. I, I know that many uh, Afghans served with distinction alongside our forces. They sacrificed a great deal. But with regard to the specifics, I haven't looked at the legislation. So, Ambassador, uh, you're an outstanding diplomat. You're Thank you. Kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gentlemen, I, I yield back. Gentleman Yields, Chair, recognizes Mr. Self. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is one of the more concerning hearings I have ever been in. A little bit of background. I do not have your experience in the region, but over a 20-year period, I had five assignments when I uh, dealt directly with the region starting in 1984, uh, dealing with Iran. Most of my assignments as a military planner. I was in uh, Bagram early in 2002, stationed in, uh, headquartered in Bagram. I was in IUD later uh, for the Iraqi Freedom uh, Operation. With that background, uh, our enduring values are not shared in this region. I have heard nothing, and I've read nothing in the preparation for this hearing uh, that it is filled with naivete. Now, you are given the, the position of having done much of this under both President Trump and President Biden. Um, I am not questioning your motives, sir, but we have to focus on the fact that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a strategic blunder of monumental proportions. Monumental proportions. Putin started moving troops within two months after that strategic blunder. And as the 20 year forever wars, our nation, uh, our military, this nation's military is not meant for nation building. It is meant to go and break things and impose our national will, our national interest on our adversaries. That is the use of the United States military. So I wanna focus on that one strategic blunder. But I also wanna read for people, we've talked about the Doha Agreement the actual title of the Doha Agreement, I think, is instructive. The Agreement for Bringing Peace to Afghanistan between the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is not recognized by the United States as a state and is known as the Taliban and the United States of America. That's the formal title of what we call the Doha Agreement. The Taliban, it is naive to think the Taliban was ever going to live up to anything. My 20 years, over, over a span of 20 years dealing with the region, this, this entire process that we've heard today is extremely naive. And sir, I, I find you at the middle of it. Um, I will tell you, I firmly disagree with your statement that uh, the restart of the war being the most important factor in the withdrawal, I absolutely disagree with your characterization of that. But my question to you, sir, as you said earlier, the Taliban was largely in compliance with their counterterrorism agreement. Can you justify that statement for us? Yeah. Uh, first, on the last uh, statement, I said I'm not in the government. Uh, I don't read the intelligence uh, now, but based on what I read, of what the intelligence community puts out in unclassified uh, products, it appears to me that they are largely in compliance based on what I read uh, of, uh, of the reports. 
but you uh, shouldn't take my word for it. You should call uh, experts who are monitoring the situation very closely in our government. We have a, a significant uh, body of expertise that monitors this, and I relied on them when I was in government. Yeah, now, yeah but, but let me just help you there. Yeah. The UN sanctions monitoring team released a report uh, last month right. in January. Right that says about the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda remains close. Right. And the latter maintains a holding pattern in Afghan under right. Taliban patronage. Right. We need to understand that the Taliban, uh, and let me ask you a, a, let a me, yes or no let question. Me, let what is the status may, may of the I Taliban? On, you no, just, sir. What is well, the status of the Taliban today? We don't recognize them as a government. Right. We understand that they are in physical control of Afghanistan. What right. is the official U.S. position on the Taliban today? Again, you should ask the, uh, uh, the U.S. government officials, but my understanding is that we transact with them, we meet with them when we have concerns, we raise with them on particular issues. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, interact with them. Uh, we don't have a presence, as you know, in Afghanistan. We don't recognize the Taliban government. We haven't implemented parts of the Doha agreement because of our unhappiness uh, with uh, what they are doing and, and not doing. So, but those are uh, uh, questions and issues for the current uh, officials, the nuances of what they are doing or not. I'm telling you what I read. Yes, if, uh, I, but, may, if I may quickly, uh, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, Germany just became the third largest economy in the world. If we're talking Ukraine funding, uh, the EU needs to step forward. Our GDP is 27 trillion. EU together is 20 trillion. Uh, Russia's is 2.5 trillion. Uh, we need to push uh, Europe as a whole to be funding the Ukraine war. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Meeks. Thank you, Ambassador, for being here, uh, for your years of service uh, and expertise. Uh, it's you. very valuable to us on this committee and to uh, American citizens. I do want to recognize the families in the room, some of whom I've had the opportunity to meet, Gold Star families. Um, I want to recognize the service uh, of our military members over the course of 20 years, the sacrifice and service. and um, uh, the brave gains that were made and the horrific losses uh, that were suffered. Uh, and so with heartbreak, I, I recognize you, and with humility, I recognize you and your service and your loved ones. Uh, I also, of course, remember the 13 uh, service members killed at Abbey Gate, that tragic, uh, tragic set of events, uh, and the scores of others who were injured that day. Uh, I wanted to try to examine three areas as Jeez. quickly as I can. Um, the impact of President Ghani's actions. When you were asked uh, earlier, uh, you said that uh, you put the responsibility of what happened in the Afghan withdrawal uh, on the Afghan government. Uh, and I'd, I'd like you to uh, tell us more about that. Uh, for example, going back to the final days of the withdrawal, uh, you said in your testimony that the agreement you negotiated between the Taliban and the Afghan government, quote, fell apart when President Ghani surprisingly fled the country, which caused the now leaderless Afghan military and police to instantly disintegrate. Uh, what did the impact of that disintegration have on the situation outside the gates at Kabul airport um, and um, uh, on the non-combatant uh, evacuation? Well, uh, thank you for what you said. Um, uh, the impact was uh, instantaneous. Uh, the rush to the airport, the, the airport crisis, if you like, was created bec uh, because of uh, uh, what happened. The security leaders, rather than standing in place, carrying out their duties, defending their uh, a city defending uh, um, the government, they rushed to the airport uh, to be evacuated. Uh, and then there was uh, uh, obviously challenges that created about securing the parameters uh, of the airport. Uh, the, and it was surprising, 
apparently across the board, whether to you, to the administrations, um, to, both to, administrations. To our, to our uh, various communities that uh, watch these things. And if he was afraid, the president, for his life, although there was an agreement and uh, a lot of his uh, uh, media subordinates said with the announcement that Talibs will not come into uh, uh, Kabul, there was a, uh, a sense of calm in the palace that, uh, that he didn't reach out to us to say, look, can, uh, can you do one, two, three to secure the palace if he was afraid uh, of that? I don't know what we would have done. We had no indication from him uh, that, he, uh, that he was going to uh, leave the field uh, and, and, and go to the UAE. A stunning abandonment. Uh, a second area, the troop drawdown. Uh, we saw that um, the Trump administration first drew down to 8,600 in the first 135 days, then down to 4,500 by September of 2020. Right. Uh, can you explain to me uh, what happened that created the, the final drawdown in the last minutes, last days of the Trump uh, administration down to 2,500? What yeah, were your there thoughts was a dis there? discussion, and the president had said that uh, the troops will be home by uh, Christmas. Uh, and uh, so there was, whether total withdrawal uh, would happen. Uh, what did you think of uh, the, President Trump in his final days in office? Uh, setting it up with the new administration having 2,500 well, members well, on the ground. Well, ultimately, uh, the, the back and forth that took place resulted in a decision not to completely withdraw uh, uh, by Christmas, but to leave that final decision to the new administration. I want to end uh, on a, uh, something you ended on in your testimony, that you saw perhaps the seeds and values being planted. Can you give us some possibility of all of the work of so many uh, folks on the ground, Afghanistan, uh, uh, as well as our military. Um, what are some of those seeds that you think could possibly yeah. spring uh, a well, better future for well, Afghanistan? Uh, most young Afghans uh, in their 20s, 30s, uh, experienced uh, uh, America, uh, the encounter we had with Afghanistan, with schools, universities, with uh, women being educated, uh, women being educated with uh, 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 cell uh, uh, phones, with uh, internet, uh, and uh, I think th they are struggling for their rights in their own ways. Not all; some have left the field, but others are uh, standing for their values. Uh, the, the future uh, remains uncertain, the struggle goes on. Uh, the values, the objective that President Bush and others had for a democratic, uh, modern Afghanistan, I think that objective that remains valid, but it's gonna be, come not uh, uh, with American bayonet, if you like, but with American engagement and interaction over a, perhaps in their own way and over a longer, much longer period of time. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing that answer, and thank you, Ambassador. The gentleman's time has expired. Yeah. Chair recognizes Mr. Kane. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witness thank being you. here today. Ambassador Khalidzad, you have a very long and very distinguished career in the United States government and have often appeared before this committee. And I want to thank you for your extraordinary service to the people of this country and thank the people you, sir. around the world. Um, unfortunately, the Taliban is once again the ruling power in Afghanistan. From President Biden's go to zero order in April 2021, that was meant to coincide with the 20th anniversary of September 11, 2021, despite leaders in the US military previously urging the retention of some troops to support Afghans. But what, um, but what conversations did the administration have on the retention of U.S. contractors in Afghanistan? Well, the, uh, if I understood the question, what impact did it have on the contractors, right? Did mm -hmm. I understand? Okay. Well, they uh, uh, became uncertain and then ultimately mostly decided to leave uh, because uh, they were concerned about the uh, security environment, insurance-related uh, issues. And although the plan was uh, that the, based on the assumption that the government would survive, that the, 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 
systems that they had, the military system would be continue to be serviced, but when the contractor departures, we had to rush around, try to find out, uh, outside the country potential uh, places where the, those systems could be serviced. Well, well clearly, yes. Um, much of the Af Afghan security forces relied on U.S. contractors to maintain equipment, vehicles, right, absolutely. and aircraft. And it must have been pointed out that without this support, the Afghan security forces wouldn't be able to successfully combat the Taliban. Uh, um, Ambassador, can you also speak to the peace government plan that was advanced by the Biden State Department in early 2021? Whose, whose idea was the plan? Can you talk well, to there the was a, a discussion uh, when the new administration came to uh, accelerate uh, negotiations. Uh, be, because as I said, even in the previous administration, the desire was to get a political agreement as soon as possible, although realistically, it was assumed that it would be complicated, it would take time. Uh, and uh, uh, the two features of the proposals uh, by the Biden uh, team was one, to internationalize the effort to get the UN to appoint someone to help with the negotiations. Uh, and second was to advance a, 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 a power sharing plan uh, for uh, Afghanistan. Not that that be the one, but to get uh, a discussion going. And I, the government of Afghanistan and dismissed it more or less uh, as saying there are many ideas and plans. But um, yes, there was a, uh, there, uh, there was a and there was a proposal put forward and given to the Taliban and to the Afghan government. How, how did the uh, Russian uh, government respond to the Taliban takeover, Ambassador? Well, uh, and the Russians clearly uh, had a two-track policy on, uh, one was they wanted us to leave. They said it, uh, that they wanted us to leave. On the other hand, and they, wanted us to uh, also stay and to do the dirty work, if you like, uh, of dealing, uh, going after groups that they would target them, and to, to see us stuck there, pay, uh, pay uh, a price uh, without succeeding. So, the, the, but uh, uh, I, 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 they, their public statements, at least as I recall now, is a long time ago, the immediate aftermath was they would have preferred an agreement first, uh, a political agreement first. Okay. But they, I'm sure they were happy to see us leave, uh, uh, no doubt to depart. And can you explain your, your assessment in deeper regard, please? Well, they, they and, uh, in the, for the longer term, they didn't want the U.S. forces uh, on the border of the former Soviet uh, territory. Uh, and uh, they thought our presence uh, in regard to Central Asia offered us opportunities um, and uh, advantages. But on the other hand, uh, like Iran, they uh, wanted to make it as difficult for us to, to tie us down to, to get, have leverage, if you like, uh, over us by remaining vulnerable and stuck there. Uh, no, not to win, but not to kind of leave. Uh, so I say before wanting us to ultimately uh, uh, not to have permanent bases there to, uh, to, to this, uh, uh, also while we were there to make us suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Are you back. From the yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Ambassador. Great to see you. Many years of this <laughs> painful uh, episode in our history, but that I would say to our Gold Star uh, families that are here and to every veteran who sacrificed, uh, we kept America safe uh, for over two decades, uh, and we can't lose. We can't lose sight of that. Uh, that we did not have another 9/11. We did not. Uh, have uh, additional attacks on our homeland, uh, despite many issues uh, in this war that we absolutely should learn from. So we've heard continuously, both in the media, from uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and from the president, from President Biden, that he was stuck with the Doha agreement, that no. you know this was 
He, his hands were tied. Oh. The Trump administration tied his hands. He had no choice. Yeah. And I just want to put out, Mr. Chair, of the policies uh, that the Biden administration walked away from on day one, everything from the construction of the border wall, our membership in the World Health Organization, uh, the Biden administration uh, completely walked away from Trump's maximum pressure campaign, tried to get us back into a disastrous Iran nuclear deal, uh, rejoined the Paris Climate Accord, ended Remain in Mexico, canceled a Keystone Pipeline, $16 billion in investment, and I could go on. All of these things were reversed on the first month, but yet we're supposed to believe that somehow he was handcuffed to this deal. Mr. Ambassador, let's go back to January of 2021. President Trump's still in office. His advisors go in, tell him, Mr. President, the Taliban haven't lived up to the half dozen conditions that were in the deal, minus one, uh, partially not attacking uh, troops, but in terms of entering negotiations with the Afghan government and other conditions. The Taliban didn't live up to the deal. What did President Trump do, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, as a result of that advice? Well, he, had, he had a stated goal of getting all U.S. troops out, Yes. right? Yes. But now he's told he didn't live up to the deal. What did President Trump do? Well, it'd be speculation, uh, of course. Uh, well, no, but uh, it's not speculation that by January 19th, 2021, right. we still had Bagram Air Base. We did. Did we? Yes, we did. Is that the only air base in the world that is sandwiched between China, Russia, Iran, yeah. uh, and is a key platform for counterterrorism? Right. Did we still have Bagram Air Base? Uh, we did. Did we still have 2,500 U.S. special operators and intelligence professionals? We did. Did we still have five to 7,000 NATO troops? We did. Did we still have uh, a, uh, over 10,000 contractors that were keeping the Afghan Air Force we flying? Did. And all of our intelligence assets, and plus, the most important thing, the message to the Afghan people and government that we stand with you, right? right? So let's fast forward. Just a few months later, right. did President Biden reject your advice for conditionality moving forward on the Doha Agreement? He decided uh, not to uh, make a withdrawal of the final uh, 2,500 conditional on a political agreement or leaving a force, a counterterrorism force behind. He essentially said, well, he no, he didn't essentially. He said to the world, we're pulling out. He was asked if there are conditions. He said, unconditionally, we're mm -hmm. out, okay. regardless of the consequences. Okay. Correct? Uh, because, uh, and when I have to say that, he thought if he stayed, he might have to go back to, uh, to war, likely to go back to war with the Taliban. But there were, but, but this is the misnomer, this is the false choice. Yes. We could take an approach like we did in, say, Colombia for 40 years, where we had trainers, we had assets, we had support, but we didn't put American troops in harm's way. There was a lot of middle ground of between places. unconditional full withdrawal and going back to any type of surge or war. True. Correct? True, correct. But those options weren't considered. And I'll just, I'll just ask you this. Um, we have had the senior leader of al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, as a guest of the Taliban. We now have reports of eight al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. We have reports from the UN of tens of thousands of fighters, foreign fighters flowing into Afghanistan plus the, the ongoing threat of ISIS. Isn't the American homeland today safer than it was three years ago? Well, I would uh, respectfully ask you to um, ask the intelligence uh, community ours to uh, look at the data that the UN reports uh, is, uh, I wouldn't rely in other words, on the UN report. Okay, let me ask you, uh, uh, Chairman, if I could in, indulge you. I think please, we're at the end here. Please. Does Al Qaeda and ISIS still have the intent to attack the United States and the West if given the opportunity to do so? Well, uh, no doubt, but I also want to point uh, that. So that's a yes. Our, I mean, just for the record, yeah, that's a yes, the, yes, they fully but intend. But they, they have the intent. But I also want to say, uh, uh, Congressman, 
that our intelligence committee, from what I read uh, in the unclassified version, since we can't discuss classified uh, material here, believe that in the next year or two, uh, Al-Qaeda does not have the ability to attack the United States. I may be paraphrasing, from the, Afghanistan, the likelihood would be- The commander higher. of Central Command a year ago testified that ISIS will have reconstituted their ca capability to attack the West within six months, and that was a year ago from Afghanistan, yes, Mr. Ambassador. He did say, but I notice, again, the intelligence community since then, in the last few months, has uh, highlighted uh, successes by the Taliban against Daesh, against ISIS-K. I would respectfully suggest that for coming to a judgment on those, that you, uh, uh, I would, maybe I you would, are I, I'm on the a, a intelligence brief. committee, and I yeah. will just state for the record, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. Relying yeah. on terrorists like the Taliban and Al Qaeda oh, well. to take out terrorists is a fool's errand and danger, and and very dangerous. We for shouldn't them. rely. Time has thank you, Mr. We Chairman. Uh, rely. Chair recognizes Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ambassador uh, Kalazad. Uh, thank you for coming back before our committee. And in 2021, the last time you were before this committee. Right. Uh, before the withdrawal, uh, I asked you if President Ghani and Chairman Abdullah had any predictions about the outcome of a planned U.S. withdrawal in Afghanistan, uh, having met both gentlemen when I visited Afghanistan in 2015. And your response was, quote, they have no choice but to prepare to defend themselves, and we have made a commitment to help them defend themselves if the Talibs go the route of a military solution. Ambassador Kalazad, did the United States stick to our commitment to help the Afghan government when the Taliban took a military solution in Afghanistan? Well, we did, I believe, uh, in the following way, if I understand you, uh, sir, which is uh, that we continued uh, to provide them with uh, military support uh, including attacks against the Talibs when the Talibs attacked them. Um, but but uh, uh, once the government had disintegrated with the departure of President Ghani, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, we, uh, we could not help well, them. I think the, Just reclaiming my time, as yeah. I think Mr. Waltz uh, demonstrated sure. so ably, uh, we did not stick to our commitments. And uh, there was not a fulfillment of the Doha conditions-based withdrawal. It was an unconditional withdrawal. And so from that standpoint, I don't think that the United States stuck to our commitment to help the Afghan gov government when the Taliban was clearly making progress throughout the country. Um, do, I, do I interpret your testimony in but response to Mr. Waltz correctly that, that President Biden did not adhere to a conditions-based withdrawal as contemplated by the Doha Agreement? Uh, I, I, n no. Uh, uh, the Doha Agreement, uh, the conditions were, one, that there would be no attacks on the U.S. withdrawing forces, that we could come to the assistance of the Afghan government, that there would be inter-Afghan negotiations uh, and uh, that there would be no allowing of terrorists. Uh, but to whether to uh, uh, make withdrawal conditional on a ceasefire, that they had, uh, that two Afghan sides don't fight each other, and to that there be a political agreement, those were not explicit yeah. conditions. Well, this was clearly an abandonment of the, of the, of the conditions-based uh, approach. Yeah, but the agreement Doha. was condition-based, but it, which conditions, it, that's what I'm I, 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 I hear you. It was, a, right. it was an unconditional retreat the way I see it. In, in 2021, also before the, 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 the withdrawal, um, I asked you whether it would be a strategic mistake to abandon Bagram. And, I'm paraphrasing you, but you basically referred me to the Defense Department right. on, that, on that question. Right. Um, Ambassador, uh, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan gave up U.S. control of the only U.S. air base in the country that shares a land border with China. Right. Can you give us a readout on what the status is of Bagram? Who is in control of it now, and have you seen any Chinese interest in that base? Yeah. Uh, now... Of course, you're right that we gave up, obviously, Bagram, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, that was 
uh, as part of the agreement to withdraw all forces. But uh, as far as what's happening there now, I'm not in a good position. You should ask the intel community to brief you. But I wouldn't be surprised if the Chinese were interested in it. But I have no, uh, I have no data or a fact to give you on have that. Have you seen any increase in Chinese investment in Afghanistan since the United States left? There are indications, clearly, from what I read in the, in the media, of uh, Chinese interest uh, in Afghanistan and activities, yes. In my remaining time, Ambassador, it's often portrayed that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a security decision for the long-term safety of American soldiers. While I do not believe the United States should have forever had a forever presence in Afghanistan, save for maybe Bagram, the way in which we re withdrew was an unmitigated disaster. Do you believe the, the United States is more or less safe with the Taliban in charge? I believe that uh, uh, the withdrawal was because of the costs and a perception that we weren't succeeding, that it was costing too much, the world had changed and we needed to adjust. But certainly in terms of terrorism, it would have, being there gave us certain advantages, being in Afghanistan, uh, rather than not being in Afghanistan. I, 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 but, I, I, my time has expired, but with ISIS-K fighters, Al-Qaeda allowed to thrive in Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban in charge clearly um, the United States is not in a safer posture. With that, uh, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, thanks for the hearing. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Amo. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador Kalazad. Thank Pleasure you. to see you. I wanted to understand a portion of your opening testimony. You said that, uh, quote, the first phase of the withdrawal lasted 135 days in which U.S. forces were reduced to 8,600. Right. By the time President Trump left office, U.S. forces in Afghanistan had been reduced to 2,500. So let's fill in the gaps a little bit on what happened between the levels of 8,600 to 2,500. Right. So that reduction uh, to 8,600, which you said occurred initially, uh, that was ordered by President Trump, is that the, the case? That is the case. And it was an explicit condition of the Doha deal that the United States was on the hook to do that level of withdrawal after the signing of the agreement in the, 2020. The only one that was specified in terms of a phase was phase one okay. to come to 8600. It didn't get into subsequent phases, except that the final withdrawal of the remaining forces would be by May 1st or so in, in, in 14 months, in other words. But there was no other phases like to go to 4,500 to 2,500. That was not specified in the agreement. Okay, and, and it had occurred per the terms of the deal within 135 days Phase of one. signing. Phase yes. one, yes. Okay. And we had felt that military advice was, I should ask them, that we could do the mission uh, with the 8,600 so that the risk was not uh, going to be higher in any significant degree in terms of our ability to carry out the mission still at the, uh, the 8600. Got it, understood. And so did, uh, you, so you said that was in phase one, so there were no stipulations of further truth. Subsequent troop, phases. None yes. of the, okay. And do you uh, recall the, any troop reduction directed by President Trump in September uh, to 4,500? There to was 4, a, a phase of coming, I, mean, if I, I believe, I, I will need to check, but my recollection is it went to another phase of 4,500 and then to 2,500. And, yeah. and, and, and was that at the discretion of President Trump? Uh, uh, the, the military uh, uh, offering options and the president deciding. Okay, D and, and did you understand that the drawdown in 2020, was that to be tied to any Taliban progress on meeting its own commitments in the Doha yes, deal? Yes, uh, well, in that regard, yes, I would say. Uh, and that was uh, their commitments, uh, especially on the counterterrorism part, that, that tie, the relationship between counterterrorism commitment and withdrawal was very tight. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the commitment on the Afghan reconciliation was not as tight. Uh, it was linked, but not as tight. We, we definitely was tight on start of inter-Afghan negotiations. 
but not on success, uh, an agreement being in place before departure, uh, complete departure. Okay, and do you recall a tweet uh, by President Trump in October 2020 pledging to have uh, the small remaining number of our brave men and women serving in Afghanistan home by Christmas? Do you remember that tweet? Well, the, the, uh, the, there was the idea that uh, was floated. I don't remember the specific okay. tweet uh, to get everybody home by Christmas. Yes, I remember speeches and statements. But if you saw that, that'd be something that would so, uh, surprise that you. I would not surprise me, no. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, uh, according to the terms of the Doha Agreement, the United States would not fully withdraw uh, all troops until May 2021. So right. did, did that seem realistic given the actions of the Taliban? Well, I mean, that was not called for in the, in the agreement, uh, and the agreement uh, had until May, and then it had also conditionality, uh, which is that uh, our commitment delivering on them dependent on them delivering on their commitments. Would, would removing all those troops have impacted uh, your leverage to secure Afghan peace talks? Well, yeah, removing troops was the biggest leverage. So therefore, uh, if we did not uh, uh, have the troops, uh, and the leverage during that period during which we would have had troops would not have been there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then do you recall another discretionary troop reduction by President Trump down to 2,500 in January 2021, just before the administration took office? I, I'm not aware of that, that there was any other decision in January to, uh, to, to, uh, to get the 25 troops out before the, uh, the, the change in administration. I do, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, I, I see my time has expired, so I yield to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, time sir. expired. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, getting the troops home for Christmas uh, makes this particularly uh, appropriate. In the back there, there's two Gold Star families, right. Christy Shamblin and Elisa and uh, Herman Lopez. Their loved ones didn't get home for Christmas. Yes. They didn't get home for Christmas because of a hasty withdrawal, because of a decision to withdraw from the military base and keep as it turned out, a completely non-defendable, or at least not defended, embassy. So I want to go through a little bit of a timeline because you, 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 know, you, you have two administrations and to a great extent <clears throat> were uh, there for all of them. <clears throat> when, there was, when Mike Pompeo left office, one of the agreements was a 50-50 sharing uh, coming out of that negotiation between the Taliban and the lawfully elected government. Isn't that true? The percentages were not mentioned, but it was to be a negotiations for a new government uh, between with shared, the Taliban. With shared authority. Shared government, yes. Okay, so the but shared authority, it's fair to say, started off at least tangentially as 50-50. And then as the Taliban continued to aggressively take bigger parts of the country, uh, because we had withdrawn and the, the, to be honest, the Afghan government was not able to put, to hold them back uh, in that summer offensive. As I understand it, it went to 60-40 in favor of the Taliban, 70-30, and then ultimately 100-0 uh, as they headed toward Kabul. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know about the percentages. There was nothing formally well, was the Taliban demanding more authority as they took more land? Oh, no doubt that as the balance shifted and uh, uh, the uh, requirement uh, and what one heard was uh, that the increase. But I have to say again that on the 15th of August, they made a proposal for a shared government uh, Okay, well, I mean, you previously uh, testified to the 50-50, 60-40, and 70-30. These are your, your own prior statements. So I just want to... I, 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 uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give the, it to you from yes, please. the transcribed I, I interview. That, uh, uh, that they have asked their change their position, but I don't recall okay, well, let's, specific let's just try to be, uh, numbers. Let's yeah. try to be fair with the facts as they occur. Sure, absolutely. There was a negotiation for an end to hostilities and a a shared government power, in many ways, 
similar to other ends of, of that. Yeah. We agreed to leave because they agreed not to fight. During perhaps the Trump administration, but certainly during the Biden administration, the Taliban was aggressively fighting. They were, in fact, taking territory. They were violating the spirit of the ceasefire, the spirit of the agreement. And yet, we continued our withdrawal as though they were not, in fact, taking by force control of the country. Isn't that correct? Uh, the agreement uh, was, uh, Congressman, uh, for them not to attack withdrawing forces. Uh, the agreement was for us, if they attack the Afghans, to def come to the defense of the Afghan forces. But we and didn't we come did to that. the... We did, no, but let's be clear. What you're saying is we agreed that we wouldn't get killed as we withdraw, withdrew, right. but we left the caveat that we would not allow the Taliban to defeat the Afghan military and we had the right to come to their defense. Right, and we did. Well, we, we didn't do it sufficient to you're stop right. them, did we? Well, uh, at the end, you're right. Uh, but um, what we surprised us uh, was the poor performance uh, uh, of the Afghans, particularly uh, post uh, President Biden's announcement and in the summer. Uh, the uh, the okay. April announcement in the summer that the balance began to shift significantly. So I just want to ask a, a simple question. Yes, sir. And it's a final question, I believe. When conditions changed and our ability to stop the Taliban by taking the country by force and putting ch children, particularly girls, back into essentially slavery, when that began to change, President Biden did not react by sending troops back in right. or anything else, and it's your testimony, he did so because sending troops back in, in other words, enforcing their keeping their agreement, would have potentially cost American lives and he wasn't willing to do so. So 13 Americans died and countless Americans and, and people who helped Americans became trapped in Afghanistan because he wouldn't send troops back in when in fact the Taliban was violating not just the spirit, but the facts of what they'd agreed to, which was not taking the country by force. Isn't that true? Well, uh, the, uh, the government disintegrated. Uh, the president well, that, that, ran away. Wait a, second, wait a second. The government disintegrated when they all they had left was an encircled Kabul. The president uh, flew out at a time. If you so, go further uh, uh, in time. Well, I'd like to go back to around January 20th of 2021. Right. Between on January 20th, 20, 2020, uh, January 20th, 2021. Yeah. What was, in fact, the government already disintegrated or what did the over the next eight months as they were finding themselves unable to hold the territories and negotiate. They began to disintegrate, disintegrating finally when they were entrapped and all that was left was an airport to leave by. Uh, you're of course right that the, during the eight months of disintegration uh, 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 increased and finally uh, in Kabul what happened happened. But I think that uh, and uh, the, the balance shifted surprisingly. The, our assessment was uh, different than what happened. I, well, I, you know, I appreciate the surprise, but Mr. Chairman, I think the testimony speaks for itself. It was during the eight months right. in which the Taliban aggressively took land that they began to deteriorate a government because we did not re-engage with troops sufficient and maybe that was a good decision, but right. I don't think it was. I think it was the decision that made inevitable the uh, people of Afghanistan living in slavery and 13 Americans losing their lives. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Um, I understand we're remain, waiting for Mr. Mills, is that correct? Okay. Well, let me just say, uh, I wanna thank you, sir, for uh, being here today, again, voluntarily, I, I appreciate your honesty, transparency. Thank you. Uh, you were in a very difficult assignment, as I always told you. Thank you. Even uh, back in the day. Uh, and um, um, it, it's very helpful to this committee to get all the facts before us. Thank you. And um, I uh, want to thank you for your service to the nation um, as well. There may be additional questions that we would ask you to, to submit in writing. Sure. And pursuant to committee rules, all members have five days to submit questions. Make sure any materials for the record. And without objection, this committee stands adjourned.